Good afternoon, everyone. I can see by the way in which the lecture hall filled up uh, several minutes before uh, the uh, stated time and the fact that there are overflow rooms also now getting quite full, that we have a special appearance by a really special lecturer uh, today to listen to Dr. Mario Capecchi. It's my pleasure to introduce him and uh, to very briefly uh, tell you a little bit about his really exceptional career. I know of no other scientist of his level of distinction who also has such a compelling personal story. His grandmother uh, was a noted uh, portrait artist in the Impressionist style, and his mother, trained at the Sorbonne and who spoke several languages, uh, was a poet and uh, was involved in the late 1930s with other artists and writers in an effort to try to combat fascism and Nazism. His mother uh, moved uh, herself and him uh, to a village in northern Italy in 1937 uh, and anticipated the fact that she might be arrested uh, for her writings and in fact was in 1941 and imprisoned. Mario at that time was three and a half years old. His mother had arranged for him to stay uh, with a local couple, uh, but the money ran out after a year. And Mario, at the age of four and a half, became essentially homeless. Uh, ended up on the streets in Italy during the course of a very tumultuous several years. And then in a rather dramatic rescue scene, on his ninth birthday, his mother, having been released uh, from her captivity, found him in a hospital, uh, quite ill, and rescued him and brought him to the United States, where uh, he went through a series of uh, remarkable educational accomplishments, encouraged particularly by an uncle who is a rather well-known physicist, uh, ultimately uh, went to Antioch College, ended up getting a PhD in biophysics at Harvard University uh, with his thesis uh, director being none other than Jim Watson himself. Watson, who Mario would tell you, taught him not to bother with small questions and to focus on the big issues. And that, in fact, is what he has done. After a short stay on the faculty at Harvard, he moved to Utah in 1973, where he has been ever since, taking full advantage of the environment there to support really remarkably bold, innovative research, including his ability to identify a pathway towards homologous recombination in mouse embryonic stem cells. And that led, of course, uh, to the incredible opportunities that many of you are now engaged in to understand uh, how it is that mammals use particular genes by the knockout procedure that Mario was recognized for, along with Oliver Smithies and Martin Evans, by the awarding of the Nobel Prize in 2007. In addition to the Nobel Prize, he's been a Howard Hughes investigator now uh, for 20 years. He won the Kyoto Prize and the Lasker Award. So it would be hard to identify someone uh, who has made more contributions to mammalian genetics uh, than Mario Capecchi. And it is my great pleasure and privilege to ask you to help me welcome him to the Mazur Auditorium. Okay, good. Okay. So can I be heard uh, in the back? Okay, yes, good. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to tell you two stories. Uh, the first will be a modeling a particular cancer, and the second will be modeling a neuropsychiatric disease. Um, So in modeling cancer, uh, the first thing that we uh, want to do is simply set out the parameters that we would like to work with. Uh, for example, do we know how the cancer starts? Do you know the inducing event? The time of induction is important in the sense that you're not born with cancer. Uh, it is a somatic disease, and therefore it should be modeled as a somatic disease. The stoichiometry is important. The initial event, uh, for example, in modeling cancer would identify a 
an oncogene and then put about 1,000 copies of that oncogene into the mouse, and that mouse was in deep trouble. But often it did not reflect the human cancer. But the most important is actually the last, that is the molecular uh, environment of that cancer. We're, uh, cancer is specific, it's not in every one of our cells. We have liver cancer or uh, skin cancer or whatever. And again, it's important to model it as a somatic disease. So those are the parameters that we keep in mind. And uh, in, our, for, in our own lab, we chose to model sarcomas. And one of the questions you might ask is, you know, why model sarcomas? They're not as common as carcinomas, obviously, but they do affect an important population. That is, young children and young adults. So I think it's, though they're not common, they're affecting an important population. They're extremely aggressive. Uh, for example, uh, many of the sarcomas we're modeling, uh, the prognosis currently is that about 80% uh, of those children are likely to die within five years after first prognosis. Uh, so, and that hasn't changed very much in the last two to three decades. So that tells us we do not know very much about that cancer and that current efforts of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery are not effective. And part of that is because they're extremely aggressive. That is, even at first presentation, they often are already metastasized. And uh, the initiating event for sar sarcomas is likely known. That is, what's common to uh, many of these sarcomas, not all, but most, is a chromosomal translocation. Uh, and a specific chromosomal translocation associated with each sarcoma. And that is likely to be the initiating event. So for a modeler, uh, that's an enormous advantage. And then finally, I should point out that it is not as complex. That is, in most carcinomas, genome instability is a hallmark, an early event in the, uh, in the uh, etiology of that cancer. And therefore, you have now thousands of things have happened to that cell. And the question is, which ones are relevant to the cancer relative to the ones uh, that aren't, that simply spores as a consequence of genome instability? The karyotype of most sarcomas are actually quite simple. Often they just contain the chromosomal translocation and thereby identifying uh, subsequent events that are required for progression and uh, finally full-blown cancer metastasis uh, are likely to be re more easily identified uh, in sarcomas compared to carcinomas. And what we're hoping is that once you've identified a series of these pl players in a number of different sarcomas, you'll start seeing a pattern which may also be useful for carcinomas. Okay, so I told you that the initiating event is a translocation, and a translocation generates four different products. You're generating two new uh, alleles, that is the fusion of two different gene products. Uh, these are all uh, the, uh, reciprocal translocations, and then you're also losing two alleles that are participating in the translocation itself. So the first thing you might ask is why not generate the translocation itself? And the reason we don't do that is simply that it's a, 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 a property of uh, numbers. That is, we can generate, using Cree locks, any translocation, and we've generated many different types of specific translocation using this system, but the frequency is around 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7th. And therefore, the pool of cells that then contain this translocation in a mouse is not sufficiently large to allow then secondary events to occur then then allow for the progression of the cancer. So it's simply a numbers game. That is, if you're a cancer uh, modeler, you want every mouse to have that cancer. So what we normally do is choose a particular product and then, uh, and then utilize it uh, of the translocation products and then utilize it to uh, uh, model it. And I should say that that is a caveat because I'm sure there will be cancers where more than one product will be important uh, from the translocation. So we have now are going back and actually generating translocations. We've been able to increase that frequency to about 10 to the minus 2 and then hope that now that will be a frequency that can be used uh, to uh, model these cancers but that work is still ongoing. Now, in t I just p p pointed out that they, what the cancer I'm going to be talking about is synovial sarcoma. Uh, 
And when we started this, not very much was known about synovial sarcoma. What was known is that it uh, often occurs near joints. And that's where the name comes from, synovial tissue is also at near joints, and therefore people thought that maybe that's the source of that cancer. That turns out not to be correct. Uh, in terms of synovial sarcoma, so that was a challenge. So uh, we didn't know the tissue of origin. Okay. So again, with respect to modeling, particularly if you're doing conditional uh, uh, <coughs> models, you want to know the tissue of origin so as to minimize the amount of work that you have to do to look at different tissues. Uh, in terms of the histology, it's also complex. There's monophasics, which are mostly spindle cells, mesenchymal cells. It's biphasic, which contains both mesenchymal cells as well as uh, ectoderm. And then finally, poorly differentiated, which simply means uh, cells with a small amount of, of cytoplasm and large nuclei. Okay. Now, the translocation in this case involves chromosome 18, and the product that's involved in the translocation is SYT. Uh, and then the other product is SSX1. There, in humans, there are six SSX1 genes. They're all on the X chromosome. And the participants are usually one and two. There's one case of uh, SSX4. And the, uh, these are sensory chromatin remodelers, but they're uh, surprisingly, SYT is involved in ac activation, and SSX is involved in repression. And the fusion gene, shown in the next slide, involves both, essentially. It contains almost the entire SYT gene, therefore has the transactivators present, whereas uh, it contains half, but also the repressive domain with respect to SSX1 or 2. Now, in this case, I, I'll always be saying we. Uh, I always means the royal we. Uh, and in this case, it's a, 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 a graduate student. His name is Haldar. Now, in the, uh, the other aspect of this modeling, this particular cancer, uh, often cancer, the fusion genes have a, a number of properties that are important. One is, is the new protein, which involves parts of both genes. And the other is uh, the cis elements, which are driving where this particular gene is, being, uh, where is operating. Uh, and in this case, we lucked out in the sense that uh, SYT, which is the main driver in terms of space, uh, is ubiquitously expressed. So we didn't have to worry about space. And so we modeled it simply by putting the cDNA, which is the human cDNA itself, and the first one that he pulled out uh, was SSX2, so we decided to use SSX2. And then we put it into the Rosa locus, which is ubiquitously expressed, and then in front of that you put a stop sign, a flanker with lax P sites, and then that makes it dependent on Cree, and then once you have Cree, you take out the stop sign and thereby control where it's made. So Cree then will allow you to express it in any tissue of interest. Okay. So the first thing we try is simply express it in every cell. And we anticipated that this would kill them, uh, the embryo, and it surely does. Uh, this shows a century. Remember, also, I should have pointed out, uh, whoops, back. Uh, that also we put into this EGFP uh, with an iris, so that allows the cells then to turn green wherever we activate and remove the, the stop sign. So the cells turn green. This is also important, being able to then pull out those cells uh, and uh, be able to uh, characterize them in vitro. So HPRT, we cross that mouse uh, with uh, that construct in the Rosa Loscus, and the consequences is a green blob, so EGFP is working. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, it still uh, has embryonic tissue, but it's completely disorganized. And this is reabsorbed and doesn't get any cancers. Uh, so that was anticipated. Okay. So then we moved all the way to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we actually asked, what happens if we express this uh, uh, fusion gene in fully differentiated muscle, uh, MIF6, which is a marker for fully differentiated muscle. And the consequence there is a myopathy. We don't get any tumors, and this is of interest because 
what I want you to remember is that the frequency of getting translocations, either in the soma or in the germline, is about 10 to the minus 3. Okay, in a lifetime, you have about 10 to the 17 cells, meaning you have about 10 to the 14th translocations. Okay, so that means that there is a lots of possibility for translocation to do something uh, in many tissues. It's mainly looked at in cancer simply because that's easy. That p population of cells is amplified, so it's easy to see it. But my guess is that translocations are going to be important in many other diseases, neuropsychiatric diseases, for example, and so on, and even myopathies. And in fact, just recently, people have started to see myo uh, translocations in uh, some of the myopathies. But it didn't produce cancer. Okay, so what's interesting, it's a classic myopathy. Uh, you're sim simply showing a muscle. This is normal. This is in the presence of the fusion gene. You have much smaller fibers. You have wavy fibers. The other thing you might note is all the nuclei are, are lined up. And what that tells you is that that uh, second wave of making muscle using satellite cells, this is a, a hallmark, essentially, a regeneration of muscle after cell death. So there's cells dying and then are being replaced by the satellite system. And these mice uh, die about six months of myopathy. Okay. So where do we go next? We simply start looking earlier and earlier in, uh, during embryogenesis. I'm sorry, I should have gone backwards. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there, here it is. Uh, so we looked at Pax3 Cree, we made a Pax3 and a Pax7 Cree. These are early steps in the lineage of making muscle. And I should have also pointed out why muscle. <laughs> and the reason we went for muscle is that's the other thing that's often in, uh, in joints. Okay? You have to move those joints and therefore there is muscle there and therefore that was to us a good candidate. Uh, so we looked at a whole series uh, of, uh, of, uh, of muscle drivers uh, in progenitor cells and what we found there was that uh, these mice die and therefore didn't give rise to tissue to, uh, what am I doing? Now we're going up. Okay. okay, here it is, embryonic lethality. Okay, and that, that didn't leave any space. And then finally we went to myoblasts. And here we could have chosen either MIF-6 or MIF-5. Okay. Uh, if you knock out, these are required for making myoblasts, they're committed uh, stem cell, or cell cells to the, uh, to the muscle lineage, and uh, I could have easily used MyoD or MIF-5, and we decided just to make uh, MIF-5. Okay. So we used MIF-5 to inactivate it, and, what the, okay. and there you get tumors. Uh, and they're also at the right place and they are synovial uh, sarcomas, and the penetrance is 100%. Okay, and I'll show you now data that, that substantiates that. Okay, uh, for example, first of all, they're green, that's good. EGFP is turned on. Uh, their, the, their pattern of metastasis is very similar to humans. Uh, here we're showing you in the lymph node. It's also occasionally found in the brain and so on, in the lung. And all of these places we find these. We think this is metastasis simply on the argument that MIF-5 is not expressed in those tissues. Okay, they have all the markers. We've looked at many uh, 25 some odd markers that are specific to, the, uh, to this uh, tumor. And they also have the morphology. Uh, if you have SSX1 in humans, uh, then you probably you pr predominantly get uh, the more complex. Okay, and if you have SSX2, you get mostly spindle cells. Okay, we find the same thing in this mouse, that is about 10 to 1, uh, the ratio is monophasic to biphasic. But I'll come back to that in a little bit. This simply shows you, uh, Mark, uh, the, uh, oh, I should point out the other thing. Oops, not here. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, here is, uh, I don't know, what it's, it's resolution is not very good. Uh, this is myogenin, okay? It's a marker, a muscle marker, uh, and it's not expressed, okay? And in fact, all the markers that normally would be expressed in muscle is not expressed in this, uh, in this tumor. And that's why it's not recognized as a muscle tumor. So those things are actually turned off. Uh, it also has uh, markers both as shown here uh, that are involved in the 
uh, endoderm, in the ectoderm, uh, as a, and uh, <coughs> and also, uh, uh, let's see, and also BCL2 positive, bimentin positive. And in fact, we've done a whole genome profile. And now there are many human uh, synovial sarcomas that we could compare to, and we find essentially a fingerprint of thousands of genes now that are uh, found in that same profile in the human. So from these criteria, it is indeed synovial sarcoma. Now one of the things that was puzzling is shown right here. It's, uh, let's see, try this one. Okay, good. Uh, the tumor is green, but this is autofluorescence out here. The muscle that it's coming from is not green. Remember, we're using myoblasts, which then will make myofibers, and therefore the whole muscle should be green. So that was a sort of a surprise. Why should the tumor be green and not the surrounding muscle? And if you look earlier in the, during development, uh, we see the following paper. So here we're looking at about a muscle just forming at 11.5 of gestation. And what you can see, these are the green cells. Okay, these are the MIF5 expressing cells that have the translocation in it. Uh, and then the muscles being formed over here, and these cells are not participating in making the muscle. And further, if we look just a day later, what we see is enormous amount of apoptosis. So these cells, this product is extremely cytotoxic. The cells are dying uh, very, very rapidly, except wherever there's cartilage. Okay, so here's a rib, essentially, at this point, it's cartilaginous, and what, the, what you see there is that the cells are surviving. So we think, essentially, that the cartilage is producing a factor which is allowing these cells to survive and thereby then continue to grow and then acquire subsequent uh, events in terms of progression of the cancer. And we're looking for that factor. Now, the other thing that was surprising is that these mice develop cancers, but I showed you an intact mouse, and that mouse was running around and has muscle. Remember that when you fuse, you're fusing thousands of nuclei, okay? So any muscle should have a lot of MIF5 uh, nuclei in it. If, we're, if they're dying like crazy, then we should have problems in terms of uh, muscle formation. So, and I also told you that MIF5 and MyoD are uh, are essentially overlapping in function. If you knock out one, nothing happens. You knock out the other, nothing happens. You make a double mutant, no muscle. So what uh, this led us to think about is whether there is essentially this redundancy is not a, an expression redundancy, but an, uh, essentially separate cells that are essentially can participate in formation of those lineage. That is, it's a lineage difference. And we could test that simply by using diphtheria toxin, again, put into the rosa locus, flanked by LOX P sites, and have a stop sign. So we can cross this mouse then to the MIF5 mouse and ask what happens to that muscle. And surprisingly, that uh, mouse is perfectly happy with respect to muscle. And what we see uh, is, and here's an example, if we simply look at this little panel, here is a marker, okay, so, so we see the green cells right in there, but there's still muscle being formed there. So, uh, and this is an independent fluorescent marker for that, uh, for having the presence of MIF5 in, in there. Okay, so what that tells us is that when we uh, knock out the MIF5, that's down here sh showing in the presence of DTTA, now the muscle's still there. And therefore, uh, it you know, must not contain MIF5 cells. And indeed, that's what we, uh, myoD, uh, MIF5 cells, right? And that's what we find. And what we see if we do RT PCR, uh, myoD essentially all of a sudden starts increasing in expression. And that lineage is compensating for the loss of the MIF5 lineage. Okay? So essentially, they're independent lineages. We can kill off one, the other compensates, so the muscle's still okay. And then, uh, uh, and then, therefore, uh, doesn't compromise the muscle, the mouse. And that simply shows the same thing at the protein level. Okay. So I pointed out that if it's SSX1 and SSX2, one is that is, uh, if you have SSX1, you die quicker uh, in humans, and that, uh, and then the other is that if it's SSX. Uh, one, it's uh, most likely to be biphasic. If it's SSX2, it's mostly monophasic. But what we found was 
in the mouse that if you looked at small tumors, they're monophasics. If we looked at large tumors, they're actually biphasics. So this suggested a slightly different model in the sense that what's happening is simply that one tumor is actually progressing more rapidly than the other. And if you first look at it in time, uh, so with SSX1, uh, we're looking down here, and at first uh, looking at it, they're already biphasics, whereas SSX2 at this point, they would be monophasic. And so that predicts that it's a difference in time, and we can now, we're doing retrospective analysis in the human tumor to see whether this hypothesis holds up. Okay. So in summary, what I've showed you essentially is that uh, the muscle lineage is, uh, appears to be the uh, source of origin of this tumor, and that we've also essentially been able to model it by putting the fusion gene into the myoblast, and in particular the MIF5 expressing myoblasts. Okay, so now I'll turn to the second uh, story, and that is the uh, neuropathy. And in this case, we is uh, two uh, graduate students, a first phase and a second phase. The first one is Joy Greer, uh, and the second uh, phase is uh, Xiaokuak Chen. So we got, got into it by accident. We've been long interested in, uh, uh, in uh, Hox genes, uh, and we've inactivated all of these Hox genes and studied what they do. And the surprise came with respect to Hox B8 because it turned out to have a phenotype, a behavioral phenotype. And the behavioral phenotype is grooming. And grooming is very stereotyped. Uh, all animals groom, uh, even C. elegans grooms, Drosophila grooms, uh, and so on. Uh, and the, the reason that grooming is important, it's a way of shedding pathogens. It's a way of getting rid of them. Uh, and in fact, there's data if in Europe uh, um, a long, long time ago in the Dark Ages where they all of a sudden were looking at essentially longevity of people. And what they found is it was fairly constant, around 35 or so, and then all of a sudden it jumps around 15 to 20 years. And the question was why? And it could actually follow the spread. And the correlation turned out to be cotton. And you ask, you know, why cotton? And there, what it appears to be is that previous to that, you made your clothes out of wool. Uh, you can't wash wool because it shrinks. Okay. So they didn't wash themselves, uh, and then subsequent to the introduction of cotton, they started washing their clothes, washing themselves, and then it made an enormous difference in terms of longevity. So this is simply uh, showing you the grooming syntax. Uh, it's very stereotyped. Uh, you start by lathering your, uh, you go in the shower, you lather the soap, you start working on the head, and you start working down the body, and then you finally end up at your feet. Uh, and that's what the mouse does. And all animals, mammals, have the same uh, pattern. Now, uh, what Joy Greer did was simply to look at the behavior of this mouse. She took an infrared camera because most mouse activity is at nighttime. And she looked at many, many different things. She simply took movies and then simply started charting out what are these mice doing. And here we're looking at eating. How much time are they spending eating over a 24-hour period? And what's shown here is simply SIBs. Uh, one, and they've been, uh, they're also both either male or female. The black bar is homozygous for the HOXB8 mutation. The gray bar is a control. And what you find is that you see a pattern, and you average it over, and they spend the same time out eating. Okay? And she did this for many, many different behaviors, uh, eating, drinking, walking around the cage, while well, making nests, uh, exploration, and so on and so forth. And the only thing that she found that was different is the amount of time to spend grooming. And it looks like the mutants are spending about twice as much time grooming as their littermates. Okay. So shown here. You can also induce grooming. You can simply spray a mouse with some water, uh, and then induces them to groom. And that shows essentially, again, in induced grooming assay, they spend about twice as much time grooming. Uh, and further, it's not re relative to genetics, because this one turned out to be, we crossed it to an outcross mouse, and it still follows the genotype of, uh, with the genotype. Okay, I told you one slight error, 
And that is, if actually we look at how much time they spend sleeping, they spend about a couple hours less sleeping, and that's because the rest of the time is spent grooming. Okay? So, uh, so it's simply a switch. Uh, switch. Okay. Now, the grooming is pathological. And I'm going to show you a movie that actually illustrates that. Uh, and what you want to see is when the mouse turns, what you'll see is that they actually remove the body hair at, the, at those regions that is accessible to it. So this mouse should turn, it spends a lot of time grooming. There, okay, so it moves all the body hair. And it's not only that it removes the body hair, but it continues to groom until it has lacerations. And at this point, then we have to put it to sleep. Now, this is very similar to OCD and OCD spectrum disorders. OCD, for example, patients are often washing their hands, and they continue to wash their hands, and sometimes they actually develop lacerations. They're not getting a feedback saying that their hands are clean and they're satisfied with that. Uh, and trichotillomania is an OCD spectrum disorder, which these patients actually directly uh, pull out their hair all over their body. And both are very common. They're about 3% of the population, and many, many different populations have been looked at uh, all over the world, and they show pretty much the same uh, frequency. The other thing that was surprising was if you put a normal mouse in with a mutant mouse, it grooms it. But the pattern's the opposite. Rather than removing hair from the ventral surface, which is what's accessible, now the hair is being removed from the dorsal side, the back. So this told us that it was not likely to be uh, a peripheral. That is, it's not likely, for example, to be an itch, because it's not going to be feeling an itch on the other animal. Okay, that's likely to be something to do with the central nervous system. And there's a wide literature, essentially, on grooming, and it involves multiple regions of the brain uh, to regulate, essentially, the grooming behavior. Okay. Uh, if this was true, then Hox genes, this Hox gene should be expressed in the adult and expressed in the brain. Uh, and I should point out that uh, Hox genes are normally not expressed in the adult and normally not expressed in the brain, uh, but this gene is. Uh, the RNA, the mutation was such, we put a nonsense codon in the first exon and a, a Lox P site in the second exon, uh, and that made the, the, DNA, uh, the RNA and DNA a little bigger. So you can recognize the mutant band versus the... Uh, the uh, uh, regular band. And the other thing that that tells you, since the signal in heterozygous is about the same, it's not a neurodegenerative disease. Okay, so the cells are there, but they're somehow not operating appropriately. Okay. So now at this point, we switched. Okay. I told you that what she did was to take movies. Okay. And that means that afterwards, then you go through frame by frame, uh, essentially uh, figuring out what that mouse is doing frame by frame. And it's enormously uh, time consuming. Very robust, but very time consuming. But a company in the uh, in Netherlands, Metris, uh, developed a device, essentially it's a platform, which has a series of vibration detectors, extremely sensitive. Okay, uh, and then what happens is that whatever you're doing, if it involves any type of motion whatsoever, it gives out a different vibration pattern. Okay, so these, all these vibration patterns are recorded continuously uh, and non-obtrusively, and then further then the computer algorithm can say, you know, you're doing this, you're grooming, or you're drinking, or you're doing whatever. Uh, and so this allows us then to do uh, quantitation of this of, uh, phenotype, and this shows you again that this is now with 25 mice, uh, rather than looking at one mouse at a time. Uh, and this involves essentially uh, showing you again that about this mutant, Hox B8 mutant homozygous, spends twice as much time grooming. Now, we knew that the phenomena of grooming was associated with the brain. And this has been shown in multiple different organisms simply by taking little parts of the brain out and asking what happens. So that can tell you essentially what parts of the brain are involved. So what we anticipated is somehow that Hox B8 was involved in modulating a circuit, a, a, a neural circuit, that would then downturn this behavior, okay? Because the mice show excessive behavior. And the other thing I should have pointed out is it's expressed in the brain, in the adult, uh, we can see it, uh, but it, the expression pattern is very, very low. 
uh, and also it's very dispersed. Uh, it has uh, some topography to it, but not very much. And so in order to be able to study this in much greater detail, we did uh, cell lineage analysis. Again, taking advantage of Cree. So this simply shows you, uh, so one mouse has a GFP reporter and the Rosa locus, again, with a stop sign. Uh, and then the other mouse is driven by HOXB8, Cree. So then wherever Cree is expressed, those cells will turn green, and that allows us to uh, follow the lineage further because it's a lineage, and that is it's always continuous. Uh, the Rosa locus is expressed in the adult, so it continues to express these cells forever, so, and we can follow it robustly. And there is where we got our first surprise. It's expressed in microglia. Okay, uh, and that here's a nice green color. CD11B is the pan uh, microglial uh, marker, and what we can see is coincidence of those markers. Secondly, it turns out not to label every microglia. Okay, it turns out that there are two populations of microglia. There's one that gets into the uh, mouse brain, the human brain, very early, prevascularization. Okay, and then there's a second population that gets in around P2 and then starts building up, and I'll show you that. Uh, and, then, uh, and that is from bone marrow origin, monocytes, then somehow knowing how to get into the brain and then becoming microglia. So you have two populations. So this particular uh, marker looks like it is the second case. That is, we don't see it during embryogenesis. Then if we look at P2, what we can see, for example, we can see buildup at the choroid plexus, uh, and then we see buildup at the ventricular uh, lining, uh, and then finally, if we look at P14, it goes way up, and then stays at that study state. Uh, as, uh, so we have essentially a marker for the second population of ingressing microglia. Okay. And once you have a marker, then you can also now start to perturb it uh, genetically in any way you like. Okay. This simply shows you that it's also present in the hemopoietic lineage. Uh, here we're simply uh, labeling uh, and then pulling out blood and then running it across with different markers that distinguishes different cell types. And what we can see, it's both in lymphocytes as well as in, uh, uh, in uh, the, um, the myoblast. I'm sorry. The, oops. Uh, myeloid lineage. Okay. So it's there very early and that suggests that possibly it's actually involved in the stem cells and for example if we look at the uh, kit scalp population which is a, a markers for stem cells and then look in the absence of a GFP that is without CRE or with CRE down here what we can see is that cell population then is uh, GFP positive and that's arguing that it is a stem cell so it, it's present in very early uh, hemopoietic lineage okay in the mutant uh, the number of uh, microglia are, are reduced Okay, so this simply shows you in the wild type versus uh, mutant, and if we do many, many counts over many different mice in different areas of the brain, what we find is pretty much about a 15% reduction. Now, I'll show you later uh, that uh, this population that's coming in from the monocyte re represents about 40%, okay? And then the other aspect, what we don't know right now, we can't follow, just because the way the CRE was designed, we can't follow HOXB8 mutant cells, okay, minus minus cells. Okay, so uh, if there's compensation by the resident population, then the loss may be even greater than 15%. Okay, so, but at least we know at least uh, it has a, a phenotype in microglia and a reduction of at least 15%. Now, if that's true, if that it is that uh, it is microglia, then perhaps we can correct this phenomena simply by a bone marrow transplant. Okay. And that works. Okay, this shows you essentially a mouse uh, about uh, four weeks after bone marrow transplant. So it's a HOXB8 mutant mouse. It's removed, uh, it's removing its hair. It continues to remove its hair. And then about two months after transplantation, all of a sudden all of that hair uh, uh, comes back uh, and it's perfectly wild type, indistinguishable wild type. Further also, the, if it has lacerations, those are healed and so on. And this mouse appears to be uh, wild type. And also if we simply look at the time spent group, 
grooming, which is by the Labaris uh, platforms. Here's wild type, here's Hawks B8 mutant mouse, and these are the rescued mutants. Okay, so that tells us essentially by doing a bone marrow transplant, we're correcting a behavioral deficit. Okay, we can do the opposite experiment. We can take uh, bone marrow from a, a mutant mouse and put it into a wild type mouse. And that is, uh, gives it the phenotype of a, uh, of a mutant. And again, in terms of uh, grooming now, uh, it is, uh, it is a mutant. I mean, it's not increased as much, but, I mean, but it is increased relative to wild type. Okay. So it's uh, not, not working quite as well. But here we're pooling essentially. Remember that engraftment is variable. Okay, how much bone marrow actually then once you, these are irradiated mice, so we're killing its own uh, source and now we have to engraft and the, the amount of cells that engraft is variable from individual to individual. And when we're looking at the uh, behavioral phenotype, then we're looking at all of them pooled together. Okay. So the complication was that uh, these mice also have uh, a defect in pain, uh, no, no, no deception. Okay, so, uh, and actually other people had published, uh, after we published, you know, the behavioral phenotype, that this might be actually the source of the grooming mis uh, mischief, okay? So we indeed see uh, no susceptible uh, defects in these mice. Uh, one crude look is simply to look at the spinal cord uh, and then simply look to see how many neurons are in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. And what you can see is, uh, if you look at this and you actually can confirm it by counting, uh, that there are fewer, fewer neurons. But it, this is much more dramatic if you look at actually markers uh, in the dorsal spinal cord. Uh, CGRP, which is actually uh, labels the incoming inference of uh, exons into the uh, coming into this uh, uh, spinal cord, or using calbindin and calretinin, which are actually labeling these interneurons, which are, receive the majority of inputs for pain and uh, itch. And so what you can see is that here's the wild type pattern, here's the mutant. You can see a lot fewer neurons in that region, and also it's been disorganized relative to uh, wild type. So there is a defect in the spinal cord, and you can also see this simply by behaviorally putting these uh, mice on a hot plate and seeing how quick do they react. And what you can see is relative to wild type, they take much longer to react to this, uh, uh, to this uh, thermal stimuli. Okay. Okay. Now, the thing that uh, puzzled us then, if we look at our mutants that we've rescued, okay, these are the Hox B8 mutants, which we put essentially wild type bone marrow into them and rescue them with respect to grooming time as well as uh, hair removal. What we find is that the noceptive defect is not affected. Okay? So, this to us indicated that maybe those two are separable. Okay? That we could separate the behavioral phenotype uh, in one case in terms of grooming behavior relative to the other behavior, which is. Uh, uh, <coughs> effect with respect to uh, thermal or noxious agents. Okay. So what we've done is simply to do conditional mutagenesis. Okay. So what we can do is simply knock it out in the hemopoietic uh, lineage, and in this case we use TI2. TI2 is expressed both very early in the hemopoietic lineage as well as endothelial cells. So both are being uh, are, are expressed in there, uh, but it's not expressed essentially in the spinal cord, for example, and so on. And so what happens with this is, first of all, uh, we do label cells, uh, microglial cells in the brain, uh, so that's good. Uh, and we also generate, essentially, the hair removal phenotype, as well as now uh, increased grooming time with respect to measuring how much time they spend in grooming. Okay. So that essentially says that, uh, uh, that those mice essentially uh, have the full-blown behavioral phenotype. On the other hand, if we look at their uh, effect with respect to uh, re reaction to a hot plate, now they're identical to the control mice. So it does not correct the noticeptive defects. So that allows us then to separate, essentially, the behavior from the uh, uh, spinal cord defects. And we can also look, essentially, at the spinal cord itself. Okay, so here's wild type, 
uh, and this in terms of Kyle Bynum and Kyle Retinen. Uh, here is Hox B8 mutant, and what we see is the pattern is essentially the same as wild type. Okay, so we're not affecting anything that's happening with respect to interneurons in the spinal cord by inactivating this gene only in the, uh, in the hemopoietic lineage. We can also do the reciprocal experiment. Knock, it, knock out HOXB8 in the spinal cord and ask what happens at the, under these conditions. Okay, and for that we used HOXC8. Okay, and HOXC8 has a very similar expression pattern to, in the spinal cord to HOXB8. Okay, it's a homolog, and so that covers uh, space. Uh, but if we look at microglial contribution, what we find is shown here, we've actually counted how many microglia are uh, labeled in the brain relative to we, using HOXC8 as our Cree driver. It's uh, about a 1 15th, a 15 fold uh, reduction. Okay, so that says that we're still uh, uh, affecting a few microglia, but it's not very much, okay, relative to HOXB8. And so what happens to the mice when you inactivate uh, HOXB8 in the spinal cord is that they have no hair defects, okay? They don't show any uh, removal of hair. And then also if we look time spending, they're identical to the control. But if we look at response to a uh, hot plate, now they're resistant uh, to uh, uh, being on the hot plate, about threefold greater than controls. Okay, so that allows us that if we inactivate in the spinal cord, it doesn't affect the behavior with respect to grooming behavior uh, and the pathology of that uh, behavior, but it does give you rise to all the aspects of the other. And we can also look at the spinal cord itself, uh, shown here. So here's wild type, HOXB8 mutant, and this pattern now with HOXC8, uh, knocking it out in HOXB8, it's identical to the mutant. Okay, so that says the reciprocal experiment also works. Now, why is this of interest? And the reason is that, I mean, one, as I showed you, a surprising result that, in essence, you can cure a behavioral phenotype by doing a bone marrow transplant, okay? The other thing is that there's now a lot of literature suggesting that many psychiatric diseases have an immunological component. This is true whether you genome-wide association studies, uh, and that's been done for many different diseases. And what you will pull out are genes, essentially, that are involved, for example, uh, the MH, MH uh, complex, uh, or you pull out uh, things like uh, 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 you know, uh, the uh, cytokines, uh, IL-2, and so on. Genes are involved in either controlling or in uh, presenting, essentially, the immune system itself. Okay. And this is true whether you're talking about uh, monopolar, bipolar, autism, uh, OCD, uh, uh, which is closely related to this, as well as uh, even uh, uh, dementia, okay. Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so there are many diseases which it looks like now there may be some involvement of the immune system itself, and what I'm showing you here is that there's a connection essentially between microglia, which are immune-derived and doing something with respect to behavior, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, essentially the behavior itself. Okay, so that uh, now we have a tool that now connects these two and we can start studying, you know, how does microglia now affect behavior? And one can imagine many scenarios. Possibility is controlling essentially the amount of cytokines and that those cytokines could act in parallel essentially with neurotransmitters to up or down regulate a particular output. Okay, that's a possibility. Uh, it's also been shown that microglia are important in controlling apoptosis, even in development with respect to the brain. Okay, uh, there is possibility, you know, you can, uh, there's very interesting experiments now. I mean, microglia, as I've already shown you, sort of look like neurons. They have enormous extensions, okay? And what they're doing is, and what, if, you, if you look at these in, with uh, two-photon microscopy, is they're extremely mobile. They're always going around feeling things, and they're spending time on synapses. And in, for, in fact, the amount of time, this is uh, work by Wake at all, the amount of time spent is related essentially to how much activity there's going on in those synapses. Okay, so if, you have, if it's an active synapse, then it's spending a long time. If it's inactive, it goes there and then removes itself and goes somewhere else. Okay, so there are many possible scenarios of how essentially this system can interact with uh, our behavioral output. 
And I should point out that from an evolutionary point of view, this may also make sense in the sense of using the kind of same system that actually kills pathogens to also regulate pathogen count. An example would be uh, uh, grooming. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions. Well, I have one more slide. I don't know whether, uh, uh, what I showed you is when you knock it out in the immune system, okay, in hemopoietic system, then all of a sudden you're seeing something. So one, a question that arises are also TB cells and B cells involved. And we can test that easily simply by using RAG2 mutants, which are not capable of rearranging essentially uh, T, T cell receptor genes as well as immunoglobulin genes, so they don't produce TMB cells. And the answer is that uh, um, uh, bone marrow from RAG2 mice works, but doesn't work quite as well uh, with respect uh, compared to normal uh, bone marrow. And so this may indicate it's not required for essentially the induction of the behavior but it may be involved in how uh, excessive, how uh, robust the behavior is. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions. Thank you. So those who have questions, please approach the microphones in the aisles, and we have time uh, for some conversation here. while people are getting themselves organized and climbing over the rows. You could do this experiment, I suppose, the other way around, couldn't you, Mario? Take your knockout mouse and actually put back in a wild-type copy of B8 driven by appropriate tissue-specific promoters, maybe with a doxycycline inducer. So you could see at what point you have to turn the turn gene up. back on and yep. in what tissue in order to rescue the phenotype. Yes. Uh, and uh, we're, we've done those experiments, but they're extremely tricky. I mean, it turns out that uh, if you, uh, transgenics with any Hox gene is lethal, okay? That is, the amount of Hox gene product is, is very carefully titrated. And if you overproduce any Hox gene, essentially you lead to lethality. So you have to be very careful how you do that experiment. Uh, we initially did it with the Rosa locus, uh, and that was too much. Over here. Hi. Is, is there any loss of, of pain sensation in, in OCD patients? Uh-huh. Uh, I haven't, I mean, I've talked to lots of, uh, of patients, uh, particularly trichotillomania patients, and this work is brand new, so we haven't had a chance now to go back uh, and see. Uh, but remember one thing, which is that uh, we're here we're looking for a, a recessive mutation, okay? We need both mutant copies in order to activate it. Okay, we've actually, uh, but uh, because 3% of the population has it, it's easy to get DNA samples, okay? We've actually looked at this DNA, and indeed, if we go to Hox B8, we do see polymorphisms in there that are of interest, okay? So, uh, so I think, you know, so I think there's a, uh, and turns out also that that polymorphism is there in very high up amounts. It's, not, it's a fairly common polymorphism. Okay, so that, that's interesting because, you know, if you have uh, a, I mean, we're saying we have a recessive mutations. You would not normally have a, a sea of recessive mutation in humans unless it's a fairly inbred population. Uh, so uh, having the so that gives you, you know, either you have to have many, many genes giving you the same phenotype, or alternatively, you have to have a very common thing that's present in a high uh, number of individuals. The other thing I should point out is that we see it, and it tracks with the mutation, but it doesn't perfectly track. Okay, uh, so it's way beyond statistics. So you know we're comfortable with making that statement, but what that says is that we do require other events to occur, uh, and and then the question is what are they? Are there are there members of the immune systems and so on and so forth, uh, which then give rise to this phenotype in humans where it's heterozygous. Thank you. Yep. Over here. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I should point out that in heterozygotes they don't show any pain. Uh, Phenotype, so by themselves, it wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't expect the uh, phenotype in humans. You mentioned that it's hard to measure um, the amount of engraftment. Have uh -huh. you thought of um, using donors that are congenic, have congenic markers, and that would be the only difference? Especially if you're doing wild type. Sure, into sure. No, uh, but the the engraftment is difficult. Sim not. Uh, not it's not a uh, an immune response itself. 
but the reason is that we're affecting that bone marrow, okay? It's, a, it's an early marker. What it, it uh, does essentially affect amyloid uh, lineages. And so that's uh, now, and in fact, uh, I didn't show you one slide. We've done competition assays, okay, where essentially what we do is to label uh, one population with GFP bone marrow, say wild type, and then the other, uh, OXB8 is, uh, mutant, is non GFP label, put them in the mice together, and then ask. And what we see there is reduction, reduction. Uh, interestingly, for example, in myeloid lineage, T cell, interestingly, under that com combination, B cells are actually up higher. Okay, so they actually have a slight advantage in, in HOXB8. So that's what the, uh, the, the mutation itself is affecting the, uh, the, uh, the, mo the marrow itself. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not, we, we use our inbred mice and so on, so we hope that it, we're not having problems of rejection. Let me ask you one question about your sarcoma story. So I'm curious, these two partners in this translocation, uh, you briefly described both of them playing some role in chromatin modeling, but they're sort of acting in opposite directions. So it sort of makes your brain hurt trying to figure out what this fusion protein must be doing fighting with itself. Right. Do, do you understand what the action of that is and why it promotes malignancy? Uh, no, I mean, what we do know is it's extremely cytotoxic. Okay, so uh, in most cases, what, what happens is those cells die. And the only ones that in this case were surviving are the ones that were near essential cartilage, uh, which then allows them to get through this. And we see the same thing in culture. We can actually pull these cells out and then add Cre in culture, and then all of a sudden, you know, all the cells are green, uh, and then things are okay, and then all of a sudden, boom, they all die. Uh, but that's, in a sense, is actually fantastic because now it gives us a strong selection. Okay, for anything we add to this particular media. Seems like that would be a great target for a small molecule, since yeah. it's oh, not yeah. something that That's exists right. naturally. That's Is right. somebody doing that? That's right. Okay, that would be good. Yep. Well, I think uh, we will now adjourn to a reception in the library, but let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.